So good evening, good evening, one and all person here and those viewers. So today we have uh, Professor Peter Vigesland with us. He is from uh, Virginia Tech, and the day two of our uh, uh, webinar lecture series on uh, um, advanced water and wastewater treatment. So yesterday, Professor David White uh, he introduced uh, introduced about the catalyst, especially two catalysts. One is uh, uh, copper oxide and another one is copper aluminium uh, uh, double hydroxides. So there we mentioned that about the, uh, uh, in that case, he mentioned about the surface reactions and the oxidation of uh, formate and oxal uh, oxalate in the solution. So here it is a slightly modified version of all these things because the nanotechnology or the material based treatment of water and wastewater will be discussed today. So here, today we have a well-known professor, uh, Professor Peter J. Vigeshland is with us. I will just introduce his uh, CV in a short because it is, as I said yesterday also, it is quite difficult to explain or describe a person with a lot of experience or a lot of knowledge. So uh, Peter Vigeshland, he did his master's and PhD in uh, University of Iowa, and then he did his uh, postdoc from Johns Hopkins University in 2001. Then he joined as an associate assistant professor in uh, University of Virginia Tech. Then now he is uh, he is the professor of uh, Virginia Tech. In, that means in Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He is also serving as a director of the Sustainable Nanotechnology in the Disciplinary Graduate Education Program of Virginia Tech. And he is the president of AEESP, that is Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. Then he is the editor in chief of Environmental Science Nano, that is a prestigious journal in Royal Society of Chemistry. So he got a lot of honors and awards. So I will just mention two or three. In 2018, he received Walter J. Weber Fund Year in Research Award. And he's the first runner-up best future article by environmental science and technology. He's the elder fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry in 2016. And he is the super reviewer of environmental science and technology in 2015. And he, had, uh, he has uh, more than 100 publications in his account, all are more than maybe, it is more than a uh, fine bad factor journal and so many books and few edited, few edited books and so many book articles book chapters. So uh, along with Professor Peter, we have uh, Vinay M. Bandari from NCL Pune and Vin uh, Vimalan Gandhi from uh, Dharmesh Desai University, Gujarat and Sridish, Dr. Sridish from NIT Warangal will join us as experts or panelists. That means panelists for us today's talk. So better, in instead of going for a long introduction, I will better, we can hear the words of uh, Professor Peter. Professor Peter, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, <laughs> so I hope that you can see my slides. Yes. Okay. So today I will be uh, talking a little bit about uh, the application of nanotechnology for um, sensing applications. And this is work that's been conducted by my research group for about the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So if you think about things that we use in our daily lives, there are literally tens of thousands of chemicals that are out there that are in commerce, whether that's PFAS, so fluorinated materials, paraffins, surfactants, pesticides, nanomaterials, solvents, all of these different things are used in our daily lives. And if you think even beyond that, so you don't just think about what we make and produce as humans, but we think about the rest of the world, there's lots of other things that are out there as well. So bacteria, virus, we're all sitting at home doing webinars uh, because of a virus that has taken over the world, um, as well as prions and DNA, and you name it. Um, effectively, the scope of the natural world is even greater than what we've been able to produce um, in the lab. So all of these different things are chemicals or biological materials that might find their way into water or wastewater. 
And so if we want to detect those, we can think about doing targeted approaches. So we're going to be very specific to detect certain different things. So if we think about all of this chemical and biological complexity as kind of a funnel, all of the stuff that's out there, maybe there's a few things that we want to detect, whether it's a bacterium, a virus, a different type of uh, surfactant or a pharmaceutical. These are things that we want to go look for in a water or a wastewater sample. But when we do that, it literally is trying to find a needle in a haystack of haystacks. So we're trying to find one little thing in a really large mess of other stuff. And we do that essentially by doing a lot of sample processing. So we do extraction, we do derivatization, we amplify the signal for whatever it is that we want to detect. And then we go do analysis. So we do GCMS or LCMS, or we do uh, PCR if we're thinking about doing biological contaminants. And when we do that, we essentially can go and think of like a chromatograph where we want to go and detect the four different things that we have on here. So we've essentially made a decision beforehand to select and to target those four compounds. And so that was kind of the chemical analysis. And then we do the same thing if we're looking to detect biological um, materials by PCR. So we make a choice beforehand. More recently, we've started to shift away from targeted approaches to what are known as non-target applications. And essentially, here we can think about, let's not just detect one thing, but let's try to detect everything. So we can do non-targeted high resolution mass spec where you don't just get a few peaks, you get lots of peaks. And then you're gonna to try to analyze and determine what each of those peaks uh, means in terms of your sample to figure out what was there. So that's for chemicals. And then there's the same kind of thing for um, biological agents so using shotgun metagenomics, where essentially you can think about wanting to detect all of the bacteria in a sample. So you would essentially take the sample, you process it some, and then you go and do shotgun metagenomics to go and see what different DNA sequences are present so that you know what bacteria were present within a sample. So in our lab, we essentially are taking the perspective that nanotechnology provides us with an opportunity to do both targeted as well as non-targeted uh, base detection. And so effectively, we could think about um, trying to do non-targeted approaches, which is what is illustrated in this slide. This is actually work that's conducted in uh, Israel um, by the Hike Group, where they effectively have been able to diagnose and classify a number of different diseases based on patterns that arise in exhaled breath. So a very non-targeted approach based on what the patterns that they can see. Um, but within my own lab, we focus primarily on targeted approaches. And effectively what we're doing is we're taking a nanomaterial and we are coupling it with a recognition element that is gonna be specific for something that we want to detect. And then we go and measure some sort of a signal. And the signal that we measure can be a color change. It can be a change in a Raman spectrum. It could be a magnetic signal. It could be electric. There's many different types of signals that can be used. There's many different types of nanomaterials and many different types of recognition elements. But the ideal capacity or capability of a sensor of this is that it's gonna enable real-time sensing. So we'll be able to detect things in real time as a pollutant or whatever um, needs to be measured. We can measure and do things in line. So we can actually think about attaching sensors to a water distribution system pipe, or we can think about it and in putting them into an uh, interior room to measure air quality. We want to have them have long-term use, and ideally we want to have multiplex detection. So we can detect multiple different things at the same time. And essentially from this, we'll have a range of emergent properties that will arise that will allow us to um, utilize these in new and different ways. So across kind of the nanosensor development field, there's many different platforms that have arisen. And essentially they use different types of forms, whether they're optical, electrical, or magnetic, and as well as a variety of different nanomaterials. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is primarily our use of gold and silver nanomaterials, but you can do things with graphene, you can do things with magnetic particles all of which depends on exactly what you're trying to measure and exactly how you want to set everything up. 
So the target uh, or the focus today is going to be on targeted analyte detection using colorimetric, so looking at color changes, or surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And I'll talk about what that is in a little bit. So to explain all of this, I'll do a little bit of a primer on how uh, nanoparticle plasmonics works. And essentially what we do is we think about taking light, having it interact with nanoparticles. So in this case, I've got a little cuvette of nanoparticles. And in this case, they're gold, which is why they have kind of this pink color. And we're going to have light that interacts with that. And essentially that light that interacts with it, some of it's going to be absorbed, but a lot of it is going to be scattered. And essentially we can take that into account. So when we look at the spectra for a nanoparticle suspension. We don't actually have an absorption spectrum, we have an extinction spectrum because it takes into account both absorption as well as scattering. So to explain plasmonics, essentially we're going to take nanoparticles and we're going to have them interact with light. And when light interacts with gold particles or silver particles um, in the visible wavelength range, what can happen is that the electrons on the surface of those gold particles essentially undergo collective uh, oscillations. So this is resonance. And this collective oscillation actually gives rise, the frequency at which uh, they uh, oscillate gives rise to this peak in the absorption spectrum in the spectrum. And so we can actually use changes in this resonance and changes in the oscillation to do sensing. And the simplest way to do that is to do color metric based approaches, where essentially if we take a nanoparticle suspension and we have it aggregate, we see that there's a color change. So this is a very simple uh, illustration where we go from having no calcium sulfate where we have a nice pink suspension to uh, 200 micromolar of calcium sulfate. The particles are forced to aggregate. And when they aggregate, there's a color change. So we go from pink to blue. So we can use this color change as a tool to go and actually do some sensing. And we've done this in a number of different contexts. But the idea is essentially is that you have aggregation that occurs in the context of a target or in the presence of a target, and then you can go and detect uh, things quite sensitively. So one of the aspects of work that we've been doing a lot lately, um, we actually have a collaborative project with uh, IAT Madras on this, is essentially thinking about uh, antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance is a particular threat because it doesn't respect borders. So one part of antibiotic resistance that the environmental community has spent a lot of time thinking about is trying to focus on what happens within wastewater treatment plants. If you think about wastewater treatment practices, you have a lot of waste material that has antibiotics, that has um, biological materials coming from hospitals, coming from households. And within a wastewater treatment plant, you have a lot of chance for resistance to arise and to be disseminated. So we have, over the course of a number of years, developed nanomaterial probes to detect oligonucleotides, such as those that are going to give rise to antibiotic resistance or actually can be used as a signal. So in the case of this slide, there's essentially two targets. Uh, we have MEC-A, which is a gene that encodes for resistance to methicillin, penicillin, or penicillin-like antibiotics. And we have INTI-1. And INTI-1 is a class one integron integrase gene that we use as a proxy for anthropogenic pollution. So we can look at INTI-1 levels and they tell us approximately how much uh, antibiotic resistance genes are present within a sample. So the assay that we have been developing for detecting antibiotic resistance is a color metric assay. And the idea is that you take a oligonucleotide, which is the target gene that's illustrated here, and you make two different probes, one that's going to be specific for kind of the blue region of this slide, so probe one, and then another that is specific for a separate region of the target, which is the green, which is our probe two. And the idea is essentially that you have your target gene and then you mix with it these two different probes. And if, they're, if the target gene is present, then you have a color change that we can observe. 
So to illustrate that, this is just a schematic diagram. Nonspecific DNA, we have two different types of probes. So those probes don't interact with one another, so they can't aggregate. In the presence of our target gene, however, we actually have aggregation occur. So there's a color change where we go from nice bright pink to more of a bluish pink. And so that color change can be monitored and it can tell us something about the concentration of MACA in the case of this uh, slide. And we can go and measure that by eye, very simply, or if we want to be more quantitative, we can go and use a UV vis spectrophotometer and we can measure the shift in the plasmon band, which is what we're observing here. So we go from a peak at about five, 35 to one that is more at 560. And we can quantitate uh, the genes based on the shift as well as the time. So we've gone and done this in a number of different waste for treatment plants, both here in the US as actually well as uh, within India. And we can detect MECA at a concentration of 70 picomolar in a variety of different wastewater matrices. So that's pretty good, but if you actually go and do the math and you convert from picomoles of MECA into actual gene copies, it's not quite as good as we need it to be. So we're still in the midst of trying to improve upon our detection level for um, antibiotic resistance genes. So uh, this is just illustrated here where essentially we're talking 10 to the seventh genes per microliter, which is about three orders of magnitude higher than what you can measure by qPCR. QPCR is kind of the gold standard for detection of these types of genes. All right, so now I'm gonna to transition to most of the work that my group does, which is to utilize Raman spectroscopy. And essentially within Raman spectroscopy, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a laser, it's gonna interact with the sample and the light from that laser has essentially four different fates. Some of it's gonna be elastically scattered, so most of it, I should say. Uh, some will be absorbed, some will be transmitted, and then a very, very small fraction will be inelastically scattered. And the amount that is inelastically scattered is 10 to the sixth to 10 to the 10th fold less intense than the light that comes from the laser. So it's a really weak signal. Um, but Raman spectroscopy is very powerful because that signal is actually telling us something about the molecule that we're actually probing. So the spectra that you get for um, the Raman spectra that you get is essentially illustrates each one of the peaks that's in there illustrates a different um, bond or a stretch or something like that within a particular molecule. So you can think of a Raman spectrum as being a, a fingerprint for a molecule. And this just illustrates um, this kind of fingerprint where I've got a whole set of different amino acids and you can see quite easily that they have different spectra. So the other thing is that up at the very top, we have a cyanotoxin that's MCLR, so microcystin LR. And if you take all of those different amino acids and you put them together in the proper proportions, you can actually construct what the MCLR spectrum looks like. So very powerful and you can differentiate all of these different things. But the challenge is that this experiment was with really high concentrations, almost pure materials in a number of cases. So it's not very useful for sensing out in environmental systems. And that's where surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy comes in. And essentially what we do with surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy or SIRS is that we enhance this really weak Raman signal by something like 10 to the sixth to 10 to the 10th fold. And we can do this because the laser, when it interacts with our analyte in the presence of a surface that has one of these localized surface plasmons, so a gold surface or a silver surface, you can enhance the signal significantly. And that enhancement actually allows you to get to the point where you can get to single molecule detection if you have everything work out um, quite perfectly. But the idea, as illustrated in this uh, portion over to the right, is that the normal Raman signal is this black line that almost doesn't even look like it's a line on this slide. Surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy enhances that signal. So effectively that's position two, and there's a green uh, star that illustrates where position two is. So you have the signal arising from an analyte that is on the surface of one particle. But if you take that same analyte and you put it within what's known as a SIRS hotspot, you can get really intense signal. 
and that's the, the blue spectrum that is illustrated here. So we have done quite a bit of work uh, trying to develop different types of search platforms for environmental sensing. And one that we have spent the most time on um, is a bacterial cellulose gold nanoparticle nanocomposite. And the idea here is essentially that we take bacterial cellulose, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide, and we um, use it as a matrix to incorporate guest nanomaterials. We then produce a nanocomposite. And so we can play with the level of gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles and train within our nanocellulose to get to different types of structures. We like bacterial cellulose nanocomposites because they're easy to produce. Um, they are essentially a hydrogel that could be converted into an aerogel if we like to use them as, as such. And they actually are also reversibly adherent. So you could take these and put them on the side on a wall in a room and leave them there for a while and just peel them off. Um, you can do the same thing in a beaker or other different types of environments. So bacterial cellulose is essentially a sustainably sourced nanomaterial where effectively we're going to take fructose and we're going to feed it to uh, different types of bacteria. In this case, it's gluconocetobacter xylenus. And effectively what happens is that this bacterium converts fructose into a bacterial pellicule. That's kind of what's illustrated in that uh, picture in the upper right hand corner. And within this uh, bacterial pellicule, we have bacterial cellulose nanoparticles that are in a nice layered structure that allows us to intercalate nanomaterials between those different layers. So our approach to making gold nanoparticle bacterial cellulose nanocomposites, which is our AUNP slash BC, a little bit of a mouthful, um, is essentially that we take bacterial cellulose which we produced by feeding uh, uh, gluconocetobacter xylenus uh, fructose with, um, so we've got our nanocellulose or our bacterial cellulose. We then treat that with gold salt. We elevate the temperature slightly. And after a couple of days, we have a bacterial cellulose nanocomposite. We can vary the amount of citrate, which is our reducing agent to gold salt to vary the concentration as well as the orientation and the shapes of the particles that are formed within our bacterial cellulose nanocomposite. So these nanocomposites are great in a number of different respects, but one of the things that's really nice about them is that they enable us to do reversible pollutant detection. So what I'm illustrating on this slide is essentially the detection of carbamazepine or CBZ, as well as the detection of atrazine or ATZ. And both of these are nitrogenous uh, pollutants. And so what we can do is we can actually change the solution pH to either force carbamazepine or atrazine to interact with our gold nanoparticle surface. So if we go below the pKa for carbamazepine or the pKa for atrazine, it's gonna be positively charged. And then it can associate electrostatically with a negatively charged gold surface. So the negatively charged gold sulfurs is what's illustrated in these diagrams at the bottom where we have a negative uh, charge. So that's our gold surface. We make carbamazepine positively charged. We make atrazine positively charged. You get a electrostatic attraction to the surface. So pH two, the signal for carbamazepine is very strong. pH 1.3, the signal for atrazine is very strong. And as we cycle the pH between low pH to high pH, we can actually get these analytes to um, pop off the surface. So we have reversible pollutant detection. So pH strongly affects sensor performance. So low pH, we have uh, association between our analyte and our gold surface. High pH, the analyte comes back off. We can collect XY Raman maps. So instead of just collecting a single spectrum at one location, we can actually collect a map. Uh, these are 50 by 50. And essentially what we're seeing is that the signal is very strong across the entire nanocellulose uh, nanocomposite for both carbamazepine and atrazine. If we don't have our analytes present, we don't get a signal. From this reproducibility, we can produce what are known as SERS barcodes. And essentially the SERS barcode is kind of the the black and the white background that you see behind the spectra for MGITC, carbamazepine, and atrazine. 
And what those are is they are illustrating all of the different collected uh, Raman signals that we're collecting across a Raman map. And they're very strong and very reproducible. So not only can we detect carbon mesopane and atrazine uh, reproducibly and have a reusable sensor, but we can do so at very low detection limits. So using surface water as our background matrix. So surface water that might have other stuff in it definitely has organic material. Um, we can detect atrazine at a level of 11 nanomolar. We can detect carbon mesopane at a level of three nanomolar. Those detection limits are similar to what you get by GCMS, but we haven't done any sample processing whatsoever. All we did is we took this nanocellulose, nanocomposite, put it into surface water that contains carbon mesopane or surface water that contains atrazine, let it equilibrate for a period of probably 24 hours in the case of these experiments. We can go lower if we so desire, but we essentially just let it equilibrate, took it out, and then interrogated it with our Raman system. So very simple, low uh, level of sample processing. Now we can go and do similar experiments, um, in this case with a range of different chloroanalins. So these are all similar structures. They have different PKAs, but we can actually go and use Raman spectroscopy and SIRS to interrogate and detect all of these simultaneously. So what we're looking at here is one beaker that contains all of these different analytes, and we're just going to adjust the pH. So as we adjust the pH, we affect which of these different analytes sticks to the surface preferentially relative to the others. So we can produce SIRS barcodes. That's just illustrated here, where effectively what we're looking at are 50 spectra for each of these different analytes. And when we make a SIRS barcode, we're essentially taking those stacked spectra, we're flipping them on their side, and we produce these barcodes. So the areas that are white are really strong, intense peaks. The areas that are black are where we don't have a peak. And this just illustrates that this is useful across these different chloroanalins, as well as for the milk adulterant melamine. Now, one of the things that I haven't talked about, but is definitely a challenge in terms of SIRS, is trying to deal with substrate reproducibility. So the experiments that I just showed were really nice because they're easy to do and we're relying upon electrostatic uh, interactions. Not all analytes are going to electrostatically be accessible um, when we do Raman spectroscopy. And so we have to think about uh, substrate reproducibility. So, I mentioned before this term hotspot. These are regions where the Raman scattering is most enhanced. And that is going to be places between particles. So a gap between two particles, tip of um, anisotropic particles. And the fact that these can be scattered across a substrate gives rise to poor reproducibility. There's a number of things that impact this shape, size, density, um, the distance between nanoparticles. All of these things make it so that if you want to have highly reproducible stirs, in many cases, what you have to do is you have to go and use really advanced processing tools to essentially produce very precise uh, nanostructures on a surface. But we've actually developed a way to get around that. And effectively what that relies upon is a, kind of thing that we happened to discover um, surreptitiously, which was essentially that not only do hotspots enhance Raman scattering, but they also enhance Raleigh scattering. And there's a lot of mathematical details in this paper that came out in analytical chemistry a couple of years ago, but effectively the underlying um, take home message from this is that we can use Raleigh scattering as a SERS internal scatter, as a SERS internal standard. And again, there's a lot of math that goes into this, but effectively what we're looking at is we're um, normalizing our measured Raman signal to the, a measured Raleigh scattering signal. And we think that this Raleigh scattering signal gives rise to a peak in the very low wave number range. But the, again, there's a lot of math that goes into this, but the underlying principle is that we just take a ratio of the Raman signal to the Raleigh signal. And we can do that, use that to develop improved quantitation. So this signal that arises essentially occurs very close to the laser line. So Raman spectroscopy is a laser-based technique. And what you do is you have a filter that cuts up the laser line. 
Well, not all filters are perfect. And in the case of the system that we use, there's actually a little bit of bleed through. This is the amplified spontaneous emission from a laser. And effectively this kind of orangish peak that is uh, illustrated here is this signal that uh, we are able to detect. And it happens to be that that tells us something about um, surface enhanced Raleigh scattering. So we've taken this approach to go and actually apply it in a number of different contexts. But the one that I'm gonna to illustrate today is actually using it to examine, detect how different ligands um, exchange on a gold nanoparticle surface. So one of the things that we're interested in is trying to quantify chemical processes. And what we're illustrating here is that we can actually see the signal that arises from um, citrate, which is part of the gold nanoparticle production process, can actually come off of our surface. So that is what's illustrated by the peak that's in green, that is citrate on the surface that's coming off. And at the same time, it's being displaced by 4 ATP. So an organic molecule that is going onto the surface. And we can see these signals coming and going. Um, and we are only able to do this because we're normalizing our signal relative to this uh, Raleigh scattering signal at 84 wave numbers. From all of this, the kind of key take home point for this particular presentation is essentially that we can see how different types of moieties on the surface of our particles or moieties uh, that are interacting with the surface affect uptake kinetics. So here we're looking at um, sulfur containing analytes versus carboxyl, amine, carboxylic acid. And effectively what we see is that sulfur bonds really are associates really strongly with a gold surface. So we get essentially complete displacement of citrate from the surface. Um, amine groups displace uh, citrate much less, so we have a weaker signal. And then if we just have a carboxylic acid, we don't see anything at all. So all of this is a possible because of this surface normalized approach. And we can even go even further and we can understand the chemistry that is happening on these surfaces. And essentially we can see what happens as you go from conditions where you have a lot of citrate on the gold nanoparticle surface. In that case, you actually have the citrate um, effectively in a monodentate uh, configuration. As citrate gets pulled off or replaced, you actually see it go to a different conformation. And that was illustrated in a nature chemistry paper that came out a couple of years ago, not from our group, but effectively we were able to see that same exact process occurring because we can do really nice spectroscopy on the surface of these particles. So the next thing, that I want to um, discuss is some of our work trying to detect pH within confined environments. And essentially we are interested in detecting intracellular, in, intracellular pH, as well as detecting the pH within aerosol droplets. And so to do this, we have produced uh, pH nanoprobes. And effectively what we do is we take gold nanoparticles, we functionalize them with the molecule known as 4-MBA. 4-MBA has a carboxylic acid group that is going to be pH sensitive. So we can use that as a nanoparticle-based pH sensor. We make these particles in a water ethanol mixture, and then we add uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG as a surface protecting agent to essentially stabilize the particles. And so we have dimers or trimers or quadrimers of particles that essentially have four MBA bound between two or more particles. And then this whole uh, ensemble is coated with PEG. And this actually acts as a very nice pH sensor. We use PEG to functionalize the particles because it essentially makes them be colloid, more enhances their colloidal stability so that they don't uh, precipitate out quickly. So, we use 4-MBA because it deprotonates at high pH, and we can actually quantitate and quantify changes in the carboxylic band, which is at 1710, so the protonated carboxylic band, and the deprotonated form, which is at 1410. So the 
figure to the left is essentially collected Raman spectra at pH three and a half, 7.6 and 12. And you can see, a little hard to see, but you can see that essentially there's a peak that comes in at 1710 and there's a peak that disappears at 1432. So we can quantitate those two different peaks and essentially detect pH very sensitively between five and 11 using this particular pH probe. I'll show in a minute that we have newer pH probes that allow us to expand our dynamic pH range. The first experiments that we did with these is that we use them to detect pH inside of cancer cells. And so we incubated cancer cells, in this case, PC3 cancer cells um, with this nanoparticle probe. And essentially the probes are taken up into the cancer cells and after a period of time, you can go and detect the pH inside of the cells. So the illustration that's in the middle, so panel B, that is a SIRS map. And effectively, you can see every one of the places where there's a bright signal, that is where we have particles that have been internalized into a cancer cell. You can kind of see the similarity between map B and the light microscopy image A. And then we can take that same information in that same map and we can go and figure out what the pH is at different pixels within our Raman map. We can do that both in XY space as well as in Z space. So that's what's illustrated within the bar graph at the bottom here is that we are detecting pH either um, in an XY map or with depth. And essentially what we see is that the pH within these cells is somewhere between five and seven is fairly typical. And that was what we expected. Um, but this was kind of a proof of concept experiment to illustrate that we could actually use these probes to detect pH inside of an intracellular uh, environment. Where we wanted to use these was to go and detect uh, pH within aerosolized water droplets. And this is actually a collaboration that uh, I've had ongoing with my colleague, Lindsay Marr, um, to try to detect pH inside of aerosol droplets inside of a room. And the idea is essentially that we're going to take water that contains our nanoprobes. We're going to aerosolize it using an atomizer. We're then going to collect these aerosolized droplets that have our nanoparticle pH probes in them already on a hydrophobic filter. We're then going to take that hydrophobic filter. We're going to put it into a sealed uh, container where we can control the relative humidity. We can control uh, airflow and so on. Within that container, we effectively have a hydrophobic or a super hydrophobic surface so that our droplets that we collect retain their spherical nature as much as possible. And then we go and do Raman spectroscopy to interrogate that droplet. And the first thing from this is that we know that the probes are internalized within the droplets. So the inset to the panel on the left is a light microscopy image that says that this particular water droplet was 26.7 microns across. And if we go and do a Raman map of that particular droplet, we actually get a diameter that's smaller than that. So that's telling us that the particles are internalized more within the core of the particle or the droplet than at the edge. Um, but we could see that there's a Raman signal that's measurable. The other thing that we could see very quickly when we started doing these experiments is that the spectra that we measure for droplets is different than the specter, specter that we measure for uh, the bulk solution. And by bulk, I mean the solution before we have aerosolized it. So we know that it's exact, it should exactly be the same as what we measure in the droplets, but it's not. And what we found is that if we look at those differences, that we can see that the pH is different between the droplets and the bulk solution. So bulk solution, and I should have said before that this is a phosphate buffered uh, solution. The pH is about seven and a half. If we go and look at the pH that we measure within the core of each of these droplets, and I do want to emphasize that it's the core, so right at the middle of a droplet, the pH was consistently higher. So whether it's eight all the way up to 13, we always would measure a pH that's higher. If we take that same phosphate buffer and we adjust the pH before we aerosolize it. Uh, that's what's illustrated in the panel to the right. Effectively, we see that didn't matter what the initial pH was. We always measure a pH in the droplet that is higher than what we measure 
in the bulk solution. We can then, because our Rama spectrometer is a confocal microscope, um, we can actually go do confocal imaging and we find that there's a pH gradient that exists within each of these droplets. So if we start right at the core of a droplet, um, so right at this line that says uh, zero microns, and we go either up to 15 microns uh, towards this red um, triangle, which is intended to be illustrative of our, of our laser, we can essentially see that the pH changes. If we go down, we also see that the pH changes. So we can look at Raman maps across um, these different droplets. But the key take home message is that if we look at this panel to the lower right, that there is a pH gradient that exists from the core of the droplet where we have a very high pH, so pH between 11 and 12. And then as we go either to the top or to the bottom, we see that there's a pH change. We think that this difference in the slope between going from the center to the bottom versus the center to the top reflects something that's going on with our substrate. So there's gonna be interactions between our droplet and our substrate, no matter what. And we're in the midst of doing additional experience, experiments with many other substrates to try to tackle and explain that phenomenon. So why is there a pH gradient? Well, effectively, we know from past studies that the air-water interface is supposed to be highly acidic. And what we think that it means is that because you have this really acidic pH region at the edge of a droplet, and I should point out that these are again, phosphate buffered droplets, that you have a interior that is going to be proton deficient. And so you have a higher pH. So this is our conceptual model. And again, it's conceptual. So there's still many things that we have to try to better understand. So all of those experiments were done in phosphate buffer and essentially to try to make those experiments more atmospherically relevant. One of the things that we have been doing is we've been replacing phosphate buffer systematically with ammonium sulfate. So if you go to polluted cities around the world, much of the aerosol that's present in the air is going to be a ammonium sulfate aerosol. And so what we can see is that as we go from 100% phosphate buffer, so the pH in the droplets is high, uh, so around uh, 11 or 12. As we go and replace phosphate buffer with ammonium sulfate, we actually can titrate the pH of these droplets down to much closer to somewhere between two and four. So we can see that as you replace phosphate buffer with ammonium sulfate, that the pH drops, which is what we would expect. But we still see that there is a effect in terms of what we measure in our droplets versus what we would expect for the bulk pH. So to try to measure pH under those more acidic conditions, uh, most recently we've been developing a new type of nanoparticle probe where we've replaced 4-MBA with uh, 4 mercaptopyridine or 4-MBY, and that allows us to get to lower pH values. And this is a paper that just came on the analyst late last year. But effectively, what we are doing is able to detect pH much uh, at more acidic regions, more sensitively. And in this paper, we haven't actually tried to push these probes to doing droplet experiments, at least in terms of our publications yet. But we've gone again back to a cancer cell model and are able to detect pH within this case in murine uh, breast cancer cells. And again, we see that these particles are internalized and we can uh, measure pH within a cell. All right, so to begin to wrap up, um, effectively kind of thinking about kind of this field and how nanotechnology can apply to water as well as wastewater based uh, sensing. We can think about two different paths. The first is to have broadly distributed low cost point of view sensors. So these are gonna be paper-based devices or other types of uh, simple flow devices. Easy to use, reliable, low cost. That's um, what we want them to be. Alternatively, we can think bigger and we can think about connected sensor technologies where we wanna be able to deploy these within a distribution system. So they have the capacity for inline sensing. They have the ability to be analyzing things very rapidly, um, reliably, low cost. Ideally, we want to have them that, with the capacity to connect to the Internet of Things or to the Internet in general. Uh, effectively, is that we want to be able to monitor and detect things everywhere, 
all the time. So two different uh, visions, both of which are potentially viable depending on what the circumstances are. So key take home message, essentially serves and nanophotonics provide us with new approaches to detect waterborne environmental analytes as well as airborne. Um, we can apply these methods to detect uh, things within biofilms, plants, and other environmentally relevant media. That's some of the things that are ongoing in my lab at the moment. This is a picture of my research group from, I guess, a year ago last summer when we were actually all able to get together, unlike now. And then the last thing, I uh, just want to encourage all of you that are listening today, if you have anything that has to do with environmental systems and nanotechnology, definitely be thinking of uh, sending a paper to Environmental Science Nano, uh, for which I'm the editor in chief. And if you have questions about uh, a paper that you have or anything, I'd be very happy to answer those by email or um, in the Q&A. So with that, I will stop and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Peter. So uh, we can go for a panel discussions. Uh, Professor Sridis, Shonavari. Professor Sridis, your uh, mic is moved. Yeah, uh, Professor Peter, thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening presentation uh, regarding about our sensors. And it's very important uh, how to detect within uh, PPM level as well as uh, the what you have explained about the application of these nanoparticles. Uh, it's been really interesting. Uh, I request uh, uh, Professor Bandari sir to uh, you know, ask, I mean, uh, he can ask some questions, then I will, you know, start uh, some discussions, what I have the issues, I mean, to discuss with. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Peter. It was very nice and you can say fundamental work in the area of nanotechnology. So my question is like a more general of nature, like what kind of applications you envisage uh, from cost point of view, because you are quite uh, focusing on the low cost part. So, I mean, I think uh, where I see a lot of this being very applicable for environmental systems is trying to detect, like we have shown, antibiotic resistance uh, genes within environmental samples. One of the things that we've actually been doing a lot of work on more recently um, and we've been doing it for a number of years to try to develop low cost uh, sensor platforms to detect uh, things like influenza or the SARS-CoV-2 virus within indoor air. So the idea is to essentially optimize a platform that we can use to go and detect air quality within a room just by simply having it sit in there and walking in and saying, oh, we have a positive signal, there's a problem. And so then you don't use a venue. Um, there's other similar types of approaches that can be done. Our lab does a lot with uh, Rama spectroscopy, but you can go and develop a electrical based uh, nanotechnology probes that are just give a on off signal that says that there's a problem with water quality or whatever. Okay, my second question is regarding the nature of nanocomposite. What type of metrics you want to choose for what type of application and what type of metal ingredients and to what extent? So the nanocomposites that we use and I think that people like to use are going to have a very stable um, background matrix. So the nanocellulose, uh, bacterial cellulose is a very stable material. Um, it's sustainably sourced. I mean, my lab, we are environmental chemists, but we can grow this bacteria and have it produce nanocellulose for us within no time. Um, so it does not require extensive expertise, which is one thing that's nice. 
Um, but you could use other similarly stable materials, but I think you want to ensure that whatever you, it is that you use, that it can be sustainably sourced and also doesn't cost a lot in terms of its production. Yeah, uh, and, Professor um, Peter, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I have one uh, very common questions. For example, if you look to, you might have already, I saw your profile, you have been, you know, attached with uh, some of um, the Asian countries, you know, involving with for the water treatment, specifically in India, for example, uh, for sensing their issues. I have very particular important questions, uh, Professor Peter. Uh, number of municipal wastes, in fact, it is coming into uh, maybe lake water, you say, or maybe the drinking water, or maybe uh, water in the earth, you know, uh, taking it out. Now, the question is uh, whether we can have, is it possible to have very low cost uh, methodology? Uh, could it possible to develop for the uh, very common people? I mean, to the, the villagers at uh, Indian conditions or Asian conditions? What do you think? I mean, I think that's definitely a goal. I think yeah. that uh, part of our underlying driving force within our group yes. is really always be thinking yes, about yes, yeah. making sure that the costs are not too high. Yeah, yeah. And um, also trying to make it so that the end use is yes. not too complex. Um, yeah. The Rama spectroscopy work and trying to do that is yeah. very complex and yeah. very difficult to understand. But looking at color changes, yes, yes. Um, that that's much more straightforward. Yes, yes, yes. Our thought is that we want to optimize both of them at the same time because it's literally the same chemical and physical phenomena that are at play. And yeah. uh, maybe one place will work really well for fancy sensors and then others will be much yeah i mean it's really eye-opening uh, presentations for us actually me and uh, uh, dr bandari or maybe dr vimal uh, all are working on the treating the wastewater in fact we always consider it's we are actually engineers and then we consider it in the form of like cod or bod okay we never thought to we have like uh, you know very ppm level of very important components in terms of water uh, i have one important question uh, dr peter uh, can it possible to have like to be have minor detections of ppb level or ppm level of maybe pharmaceutical chemicals which have been incorporated in the water Okay, maybe in drinking water itself through the, let's say, bore water, which have been taken it from the well, bore well, to a certain level, it usually happens. So, uh, what should be the possibility of a detections in terms of, uh, we cannot have, as a, let's say, in the village, these are the real issues, uh, whether we can have that uh, possibility of a, a very simple sensor system. Uh, as a, uh, we can go and detect it, how in terms of form of change in the pH or change in some uh, surface charges of the material of nanomaterials or something kind of that. Can you please explain on that? I mean, I think it's definitely possible. Yes. You would have to decide yes. what you want to detect. So you make a decision in terms of how something is going to be engineered at the very beginning. Um, detecting some bulk parameter like COD, that's yeah. not going to be doable. But if you want to yeah. go and detect sure. a particular chemical that you know is being used in a location, so a pesticide, so like atrazine yeah. is a good example, yeah. you can optimize the system we haven't looked so much at waste yeah, obviously water, at the, uh, but I think that uh, yes, true. the idea yes, is yes. definitely yes. useful yes. for yes, obviously. Yeah. Understood. any other analyte as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Dr. Peter, uh, Professor Peter, I have only again one second questions related to, for example, whether we synthesize one uh, nano materials and coat onto uh, onto the plate, for example, as a, to make it in a sensory device, for example. So. Uh, how is possible, for example, let's say, uh, I'm just thinking a different way. Like I want to make an, uh, 100 uh, uh, sensors, okay? Uh, whether it's possible to have, let's say, gold particles, what you have quoted. Is it possible to have the same kind of system? Is it uh, uh, going to be need to be required or uh, the distribution is mattering or uh, what, what uh, things has to be taken care? Can you explain that one last time? I didn't quite get what yeah, the yeah. question. I mean, I mean uh, the sensor, what we're developing, for example, it is really interesting to be have a sensor, obviously, what you explain. But the question is, let's say I want to make it in replicas, maybe 100, I want to make it the same kind of sensors. And out of the same sensors, uh, every sensor should have give the same kind of output, for example, okay? And we want to distribute in, for example, in society. Lastly, mm -hmm. what we are doing it is for society to see it, to use this sensor. It is perfect one. Uh, you can test it. Uh, this kind of uh, um, what it is called pollutants can be identified in PPM. So whether this nanobatteries, what have been quoted, what kind of precautions should we should take so that it will have the almost uniformity maybe for 100 sensors or 1,000 sensors. So lots of things I can comment on there, um, which is good. Um, I think that uh, to detect hundreds of different things is doable. Um, you have to decide what the signal is that you want to be monitoring for. So that's actually why I like to start uh, this presentation with kind of the yes. non-targeted uh, detection that uh, people are doing. And the idea there is not so much that you are looking for any particular signal for any particular molecule, but you're looking at a series of signals that tell you that you have a particular contaminant there. And the series of signals vary for one analyte versus another. And so you can do um, analytical. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Peter, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. The issues like the arrangement of the nanomaterials on the sensor, is it how much impact on the detections? That's what I want to Okay. Say. Um, so the arrangement definitely impacts things, yeah, and, but it also yeah. is dependent on what exactly you're measuring and what the system is. Part of the reason that we have done a lot of work with nanocellulose is yeah. it's a layered structure. So right. the nanocellulose is layered and in between the layers is where the gold particles are that are our sensor. Okay. The layer structure of the nanocellulose makes it so that organic material, uh, NOM, can't get in to the sensor. So you essentially are restricting access to the sensor to things that you want to detect. So in our case, it was atrazine, carbamazepine, and a number of those other different analytes. But we can do that. Yeah. And, uh, and um, uh, yeah, this is my, I mean, uh, my questions are over. Really uh, nice, uh, Professor Peter. I mean, really appreciable. And it's really, it was very important issue about uh, detecting of the minor components, which are, let's say, cancer causing agents, which are really important. Maybe the country who is, uh, maybe it's a world global problem. And it has been usually uh, uh, by the uh, UNESCO, USEF, these all are indicating what are the uh, components are there. Every year they are sending some list of important components and which are emerging pollutants, what I mean to say and uh, detecting them at a uh, uh, very small kind of level. Uh, Professor Peter, it's really eye-opening, I think so. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Nitish, uh, yes. mine is over. Uh, you can give it to any other questions. Do Do Dr. Vimal, please. Dr. Vimal, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Peter, for enlightening lecture on nanobiosensors or nanosensors. 
just my question is related to how this nano sensors create another kind of threat to the environment first question second thing ha uh, please, uh, please we have done quite a bit of work looking at the potential implications of nanomaterials to the environment and under all of the conditions that we have ever looked at things both within my own group as well as a number of other groups um i think that uh nanotechnology particularly gold based nanotechnology there really is minimal threat um in terms of these nanomaterials getting out into the environment um we've been exposed to nanomaterials for literally eons um over the entire course of our existence and we have the ability to address that as well as do many other uh, organisms now if you go and you put something or you make an nanomaterial out of a toxic material it's going to be toxic in our case gold is not toxic at the levels that we use it and another thing that we are striving to do because gold is still a precious resource is to try to make it so that we can actually reuse our sensor platforms and we don't lose any of the materials but i think that uh, in terms of any particular threat um with at least with our structures there's minimal yes uh, another question uh, in place of gold can we use any other suitable metal like copper or iron so that we have advantage of cost as well as it is easy to separate in the case of iron or fe metal so for our particular sensor platform where we're doing surface enhanced drama spectroscopy you pretty much are limited to either gold or to silver and gold is usually for environmental applications better because it doesn't dissolve as readily as silver now what we are doing though is thinking about iron is we are actually taking iron nanoparticles that are magnetic yeah. and we are functionalizing the surface with gold so that we still retain the gold surface enhanced drama spectroscopy that we want but we have particles that we can move with a magnet and recover so it is kind of metal nano composite uh, gold that is coated by some of the iron particle so that it is easy to separate out exactly right sir and another last question from my side sir uh, i am go through your paper of that uh, that is related to exposum and is it possible to find pollutants or identify chemicals from environment or from air with the help of nano sensors effectively i think in terms of real world application probably not yet but i think that there is definitely a lot of interest and there's lots of promise um i mean there are applications where we do nanotechnology for sensing i mean home pregnancy tests are essentially nanotechnology enabled platforms and so the idea within the community is to try to take those same ideas and um push them forward for much broader dissemination so i don't know that we're there yet in terms of people being able to go to the store and buy a nano sensor for detecting something but i would say that within the next 5 to 10 years we'll definitely be there thank you sir thank you very much for your informative lecture on biosensors nano sensors and it will definitely helps us to incorporate this kind of work in our research and we will definitely try to submit some of the articles to your journal that would be good okay thank you thank you very much peter and uh, panel members so today we talked about something different than last last time yesterday's talk we focused on the sensing of these compounds or uh, elements in, or we can say the water quality from <coughs> even uh, uh, yes uh, can i interview for one uh, small minute because i have one again in small query okay. <laughs> related to okay okay please well, go ahead is it okay na i mean is okay, okay. no like, problem uh, yeah. it's okay no problem yeah, go ahead uh, professor peter uh, actually in what uh, in usually in india the situations are mostly if you take as in um, asian countries earlier time <clears throat> there is water used to be taken from the lake i mean uh, still 
the uh, earlier maybe 19th century water used to be usually been taken from the lake okay <coughs> for the drinking purpose itself so what kind of uh, sensors you would like to be suggest i mean to be have to be very much perfectly to be done to be make it for the social or societal use actually to be have detecting some component is it possible to have a kind of a single sensor which can have these are combinations of which all the organic components we can independently just, just one minute uh, i just we have some uh, limits for uh, lab time so i request you that i have to leave lab now okay okay so i'll take your permission i'll take no leave okay thank you professor peter we'll thank see you. you again see you soon Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vidish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead with the. Huh. Yeah. 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 And this is my this last question. And uh, Doctor uh, Professor Peter, can you just? I mean, uh, I was thinking in the, uh, in that angle. Like, uh, let's say it won't possible to have uh, for a common people. Uh, to have maybe the corporations municipal corporations or the government agency can detect these are the some of the contaminants are present in this drinking water for that lake particular lake where from the whole uh, uh, let's say whole uh, village or maybe whole uh, community is taking water from it and if you detect it that would be good thing but immediately this detections what you said it's uh, really very wonderful but i have only one questions that whether at what extent of level we can go it through the sensor we can develop it i mean i think it's possible and i think that that's kind of the goal is to be able to detect yes. things within a lake or in a river or whatever water body that you're talking about yes. the one of the drivers for doing uh, kind of low cost sensors is essentially to democratize knowledge and make it so that people can have access to things that are affecting each and one, every one of them. And getting there is still a long road and what people would actually do with that information is unknown. But I think that uh, that's kind of one of the goals. We're definitely not there yet, but I think that uh, as the technologies develop and we really are thinking about not having just making really cool things for the lab but actually trying to get them into the yes, people's yes. hands then that's yes. where we want to be definitely not there yet though yes. and, uh, professor peter lastly the kind of array we can have uh, nanometers can we have developed in a such a way where the particular array of a material for example gold will give the particular determination of particular component at a ppm level or ppb level or maybe copper at a particular level or such a kind of arrays can it possible to have and uh, can we do such kind of things so that you know whole ppb level of compositions we can identify i mean it's definitely possible i mean if you think about Yeah. You can buy right now um, like metal sensing strips that essentially right, will detect right. a whole array of metals. Right. And you can, right now, the detection limits for those aren't very good. But with nanotechnology and yeah. some improvements, we can get there and improve metal detection pretty quickly, I think. Um, yeah. Some of the organic analytes, it's probably a little harder. But right. there's, there's ways to do that as well. Right. yeah uh, so, nitish uh, professor uh, nitish to over to you uh, so yeah. sir uh, we wish that uh, your lab is coming out with identification of this covid 19 droplet also with study on covid 19 droplet also like yeah. cancer cell yeah, in yeah. future yes, yes we're yes. trying yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes really nice sir i saw thank you very much sir yes, yes. so uh, nitish sir okay okay thank you thank, thank you very much so uh, suresh kachan is going the last uh, last session is going on so Uh, i would like to express my gratitude to professor peter because uh, with a single email he uh, confirmed his, his uh, he will present this on this platform 
and the presentation was very nice because uh, he talked about the application of uh, sensors in uh, for detecting different type of uh, compounds or even water quality parameters like ph even in the aerosol of course this is slightly different from uh, what our the, our theme because we focused mainly on uh, treatment of water and wastewater but the sensors and its application in especially based on the nano composite or nano particles is extremely very good and this very good uh, very good to hear also and i also thanks to uh, our panel members dr vinay dr sirish and to dr vimal for joining with me for uh, and for their vibrant uh, discussions on the topic of nanotechnology thank you everyone and thank you for the viewers and tomorrow uh, we will have a professor ashok gargil he will join 10:30 am tomorrow morning uh, he will talk about afford, uh, arsenic removal from water with uh, affordable techniques and uh, uh, professor peter we have some more questions from the young aspirants that they po already posted in our facebook so that i will send you in uh, uh, email so that you can reply it because the time, there will be a time limit for us because you are, you are on, only the wake up time now it's around around 8 o'clock 8:30 to you so that so i don't want to <laughs> make so much of trouble to you around we received around 10 15 questions so i will send you by maybe by today itself so that you can uh, take some uh, some of the questions positively so that that i will post it in my facebook our facebook account so thank you thank you everyone for joining with me thank you yeah. and have Just, a great yeah, day uh, dr nitish when question actually facebook uh, link uh, can you share with all of us where you know it's... okay okay i i i'll share with you everyone yeah. i'll share with you so that uh, yeah. tomorrow also you can join with us yeah, yeah. i mean okay. uh, that link also and whatever we have discussion today maybe it will be remain live maybe somebody right right it will be live in uh, facebook you can watch yeah. later also so yeah, yeah. tomorrow also you can watch uh, the program in uh, facebook Yeah. Everybody can watch this uh, yeah. program in Facebook because yeah. it, there Thank is no restriction for anyone. Yeah. Thank you, Professor I mean, Peter. Nice. Thank you, Vimal. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See you there. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Good day. Good day. Yeah.